One of the things we've never talked about on this channel is what life is like in occupied Ukraine. Well, f there's apparently some YouTuber who's been uh, pretty much a Russian propagandist who got an invite in with some of the occupation's military police forces. Uh, I was a military police officer myself, so let's see what passes for MP work in occupied Luhansk. Let's get into it. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. I'm Patrick Lancaster, and right now we have an exclusive report in the city of Lugansk with the Russian forces uh, military police, as you see behind me. Okay, so right here, first off, I want to point out some stuff about this guy's gear. You may notice a large uh, bump here. Uh, I think that's because this dude's fat. Um, but he's got, you know, a, a plate carrier on, front back plates, couple mags, radio, flashlight. Uh, this is this is not a crazy military police setup. The only thing he's missing that I see is um, some zip ties or handcuffs, right? You want to be able to detain people um, if you're doing this. Looks like he's running what's called TCPs or traffic control points, Um and TCPs, we did them a lot in Afghanistan. So, uh, well, uh, overall, unfortunately, behind, in modern war, behind the lines and the front lines are oftentimes, well, in Afghanistan, they were completely blurred, right? There was no meaningful difference. Um, there were no front line of contact. There was no rear area. Um, so being a military police platoon in that war, uh, you were expected to just basically partner up with the local police forces in general. We, we had a different situation because they basically ran out of troops and we were what's called a battle space owner. But most MPs, their experience was to be told, Hey, here's your Iraqi police station. Here's your Afghan police unit. Um, you guys are responsible for making them an effective policing force, which usually meant uh, doing counterinsurgency, finding bad guys, getting found by bad guys, shooting them, getting blown up, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a reason why I did the math the other day. One in 30 uh, U.S. military members killed in the global war on terror uh, were uh, military police soldiers. Whoa. Отдел военной полиции военной комендатуры Луганской Народной Республики совместно с подразделениями Росгвардии, Министерством внутренних дел, спецназа Махмат выполняют задачи. Okay, so this is really interesting. Notice the three units that they dropped here. That they are obviously the military police department of the military commandant's office. So this is um, a reflection of the fact that, that the area is currently under martial law. So the commandant's office likely refers to the military commander in charge of the region. Uh, and then he's also supplemented by Rosgardia, the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs National Guard, which is interesting because um, when Wagner was dissolute, uh, uh, di dis, 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 oh my gosh, was uh, dissolved, some other word I want there, uh, Many of them were offered positions in Rosgardia, and the fact that they are away from the front line, I think, reflects a sentiment among the Kremlin that these troops are, these Wagnerites are still not fully loyal to Moscow. But what's even more interesting is you see here, he's also partnered with Akhmat Special Forces. Akhmat Special Forces are Chechen forces. And we've heard that Kadyrov, the quasi dictator of the Chechen Republic, has expressly said that he doesn't want his troops, despite being pretty well trained and pretty well equipped, that he doesn't want his troops near the front lines, um, simply because they are uh, his his power base. His power base is, is based on people in, within his tribal structure um, reporting directly to him. And if they're all killed off uh, in operations, then he's going to be left with no power base to hold down the fort, so to speak, against rivals elsewhere in Chechnya. Right. Right. One of the things, of course, he says martial law is in effect 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. Um, here, here's the thing, guys. Uh, this is kind of symbolic. Um, the fact is that if you're a partisan, if you're 
again, for me, I think like Taliban or uh, Haqqani Network guys who were we were worried about, um, but they're probably worried about Ukrainian uh, saboteurs, Ukrainian partisans gathering intelligence and such. Um, there's this belief that this curfew helps, that only nefarious things happen at night. But the reality is that the best partisans are going to be going to look like regular people and they're going to operate during the day. Um, they're just going to be out and about. They are going to look like regular Joe Blow people. They're just going to happen to engage in some other activities uh, that support, in this case, the Ukrainians. So we would go out a couple of times at night just to sort of be unpredictable. Um, but uh, believing that you're going to catch... Uh, a an organized insurgency um, by going out at night is just wrong. Like going out at night will work if you're trying to catch um, like teenagers up to no good, uh, tagging walls, or um, you know uh, maybe using drugs or drinking in public, right? Like, uh, you know, teenagers will go out when their parents or guardians are asleep. Um, young people will often do it because they just sort of aren't, may not have steady employment. And this may just be a, a more convenient schedule for them. Um, but systematic insurgencies who are adults who are focused and trying to achieve something under the guise of, a, of the, the region's authorities, um, they don't do stuff at night. They're easier to catch then. So I want to observe, again, point some stuff out. This dude has, these dudes have a lot of gear. It looks absolutely sterling. It looks pristine. Um, you know, that's not to say that they don't do serious business, but man, this is like pristine looking gear. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, again, there are perhaps military police units who are actually dismantling these, um, uh, like Ukrainian networks, and I suspect that they have a hard job. But these guys running a traffic control point late at night, total waste of time. Сейчас подъедут, когда сотрудники ВВП пишут документы. Again, checking documents sometimes is a useful technique um, because you'll just quiz people on the documents themselves. You'll try to see if they themselves know where their uh, fake documents were produced and where they've come from. Sort of like a fake ID, right? You're a bouncer, you hold an ID, you think it's fake. You just ask them questions. What's your date of birth? What's your address? Right? Now, again, that works if you're trying to catch... Um, individuals with uh, fake IDs, but a good partisan is going to have a legitimate ID. They're never going to do an activity that doesn't have a legitimate cover, right? That's the easiest thing. The best way to uh, not get charged with a crime is to not commit a crime. And so this idea that you're going to catch people with like fake documents, uh, trying to infiltrate Ukraine at night or trying to infiltrate uh, the occupied regions at night, it's just not very likely. Now, obviously, the catch is that you can't just yield the night, right? If they're like, oh, every every MP just packs up and goes home at 5 p.m., well, okay, you can't do that either. But again, this belief that you have to do these extra steps is just sort of preposterous. <laughs> Notice he's Chechen, because look here. One, you can see this is kind of Akhmat, but that's um, one of the founders of Chechnya. So this is, again, a Chechen soldier. He's got great gear, uh, really top-notch equipment. Um, I suspect he's wearing the mask because he's obviously Chechen. Документов нету в барышне. 
Документов нет у женщины. Подтверждаю, что ее муж вот прописан по этому адресу. Да, там репортеры. Это муж, да? Да. Ничего нет, может? Okay, so notice here you got the Chechen guy here. He's checking documents, and you have the MP here who's reviewing things. Oftentimes in the United States, um, different agencies have different authorities, right? So, for example, let's say you had, let's say this guy was an ATF agent. He'd be, he would have the authority to arrest uh, someone for weapons charges, but he could not, for example, arrest them for drug charges. Instead, that would fall on a different law enforcement official. He, a federal official, for example, can't arrest someone on state charges. Um, instead, they would have to arrest someone on uh, federal charges. So oftentimes in the United States, you'll have, when you see multiple entities working together, it's because they want to mutually overlap, mutually support each other's authorities. So you'll have, um, you know, again, the classic example would be, um, let's say there is a, uh, like Hispanic drug gang operating at the border, right? The FBI will go in, they'll go in with the DEA so they can arrest them for drug manufacture and possession. They'll go in with the ATF in case someone has firearms and they can arrest them for things like felon in possession or illegally modifying a weapon. And then they'll go in with um, ICE officials, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, so that if some of those individuals don't have proper documentation to be in the United States, then they can be arrested and charged with that. And the idea is that they're able to, uh, one, find something for everybody to create multi-layered prosecution uh, opportunities so that when they go to the U.S. attorney and say, hey, we arrested these guys, they're all members of this notorious drug gang, um, and you, the prosecuting attorney, can weigh the evidence against each one of them and stick them with the charges that are going to be most likely to uh, result in a uh, in a, in the sentencing that the, the U.S. attorney wants. Again, what has the strongest evidence, which one is most clear. It just gives a, a big menu of options to that uh, U.S. attorney. Now here, I don't know if that works this way. Again, this is a this is a military region, so it's very possible these Chechen guys have just been deputized and that the MP is just the officer in charge. But if I saw this in the United States, that would be my first thought. <laughs> Where do you live? The address which is written here. Okay, that's actually kind of sus. No, see, you got a military working dog. I love the vest. The vest just says police in English. FYI, guys, these working dogs, very, very tough to train up, very expensive. And when I was on active duty, again, you know, this was uh, 12, 13 years ago, um, military police uh, dog handlers were extremely sought after. I would say typically they would be sent, they were either, they were deployed with the absolute minimum of stateside time. And often when they were stateside, they actually would often get... Um, tasked by the Secret Service to prepare for uh, VIPs like the president or vice president uh, conducting tours. For example, they would routinely go to places like Mexico City or 
Caracas or um, Europe, and they would uh, run their bomb sniffing dogs through like a hotel that the president might be staying at or down a street. And the idea would be to clear the area ahead of a presidential visit. Um, but they were just so sought after because it's such a unique skill that I'm surprised, honestly, that Russia even considers it worthwhile in a place like Luansk when you could have this explosive sniffing dog, uh, for example, clearing out recently occupied areas. So the dogs in the U.S. are trained to sit when they detect an explosive. Or drugs. Uh, some dogs can be trained to do both. This guy looks like some kind of some kind of retailer doing like arbitrage or something, right? He's shipping this van to and from a certain spot. Dog's looking for stuff. See if there's anything good to smell. This guy maybe some kind of delivery man or postman. And, you know, again, these dogs, they're not perfect, but they what they can do is save you a lot of time. They can give a quick sniff. You saw that took 30 seconds, 45 seconds. And if he had alerted on something, they would likely say, OK, here's the thing he alerted on. Let's pull it out. Let's take a look at it, because sometimes it's nothing. The dog alerts on some beef jerky you had, but sometimes it's something. Oh, that was interesting. Look back here a little bit. See this patch, this little Batman patch? I think that is the Batman patch of um, Russian intelligence. So it says that perhaps a Russian intel officer has been called out. Yeah, and stuff like this, these dogs are not perfect. Um, tr tr trusting them to trace down a, a criminal by scent is pretty dangerous, right? Dogs are easily distracted. They don't know they're chasing a criminal. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's so imperfect, uh, that in the U S again, the dog will usually be a first screen, but then it'll be confirmed through something else. Yeah. Notice kind of the different camo patterns. These guys have a pretty, it's pretty iconic among the Chechens, this kind of faded, foggy, um, it's, a, it's an older Russian style of camo, but some of these guys are rocking multicam which weird because it was developed in the U.S., but now is just totally widespread. This again, he's got his badge BAN. I'm not sure what that means, but this is a Reddish Russian Federation um, double eagle. Oh. 
Ваш тоже можно документы пассажир? Алло. Говорят, ну все, на связи тут. Документы на транспортное средство. No, it looks like the paddy wagon's coming to detain somebody, right? They call when they got somebody to detain, they'll be picked up and brought to the police station. First off, some of these trucks, these industrial trucks, they actually often have to move at night um, because traffic can get so busy and so blocked off with street parking and the like that they may not have the actual uh, space to move. They also, if they have to, for example, conduct repairs on, say, a building, especially in this case, it's been destroyed um, or moved to a construction site, it may be physically impossible to get there to the construction site unless they move uh, on off hours. It's true even in the United States. Um, oftentimes during regular traffic hours, um, it's uh, illegal for large cranes or other large trucks to move except down certain wide roadways. Um, but in major cities like New York or DC or LA, you're going to see it. It's going to be rare that you see those big transport trucks, but you know they must operate because your restaurant, your favorite restaurant has food, your the local hardware store has supplies, right? New buildings go up and they get those materials somehow. Uh, and so that's why this is probably extremely common for these sort of drivers to operate. <laughs> And, you know, I just want to take a sec to acknowledge that this isn't right. This isn't me offering like right or wrong. Um, this is obviously humanizing uh, the Russian occupation here. Um, but this is also a really probably one of the best insights I've seen into the Russian occupation. And I'm trying to explain why militaries do what they do. This isn't an endorsement. This isn't an encouragement. Um, you know, if you're interested, um, in getting, uh, another perspective, right. You can always, of course, uh, check me out on combatvetnews.com. Um, this is where, when there is combat footage that's dropped, we do the same level of analysis of the of military tactics, the military units, the locations, and twice a week. It's all uncensored combat footage, um, and it's for members only. So if you're interested in supporting this channel, supporting the analysis that I do, check it out, right? Any one of these tiers will get you access to those twice a month videos, and they make a tremendous difference for me. As a war content creator, I have very, very few sponsors. So I appreciate each and every one of you guys that support. This is really interesting. They find illegal weapons when searching soldiers. Now notice here. So now we see most of the people that are coming through are civilians, but they're not just checking the civilians. They're also checking the military, uh, the people that come through, the soldiers and whatnot. So they're pretty much checking everyone to, as they say, make things as safe as possible here in the center of Lugansk. That's what they have to say about it. All right, this is actually not, like, this guy is not really trying to spin a narrative too hard. Um, he's still using, like, Russian terms for things, the People's Republic of Luhansk, for example. Um, but you notice here, here's an up-armored uh, vehicle, right? Good for, uh, it's a good, like, blend. It could be a shooting platform in case, again, they get attacked by, like, partisans. Um, it also can be a paddy wagon, right, for rolling people up and detaining them. But it is extremely common to see soldiers, uh, Russian soldiers, flee the front lines. And so it... They likely, it's implied that they're checking for weapons or whatever, but obviously soldiers with weapons is not, um, soldiers with weapons in a war zone is not really exceptional. What is exceptional though, is making sure these soldiers are um, not going AWOL, not fleeing the battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right, it's already a little suspicious because this soldier has a lot of his personal gear. A lot. He says, I'm just coming from work. I'm just coming from work. I think he means I'm like returning from duty. Um, they ask, what's this? He says, hey, it's a rifle. I've got four of them. I think it's a medium. So it's tough to know. That's a very nice rifle. Look at this shooter stock. Um, let's see if we can look up what a Lobayev's rifle is, but I'm really curious. That's a, that is not a, um, nope. Let's see, Lobayev's rifle. Oh, okay, here we go. Interesting. Look at this. Lo Lobayev Arms. It's a DVL line. Okay, interesting. Look at this. Oh, it is. He's a marksman or a sniper or a designated sniper or something like that. Um, interesting. I wonder, so it says, are you? So this is a Russian company, but it looks like it might be one of these. So it's a bolt action sniper rifle. Um, again, multi-caliber, range of tasks. Uh, interesting. Looks like an interchangeable barrel um, in 308 win Lapua and 338 federal, which is really interesting. Um, right. Five minute barrel change, but none of them in, let's see. Interesting. Oh, it's a Russian manufactured company. interesting he's like oh i've got five of them okay so clearly these guys are all fans but you can see here right it's definitely a marksman's rifle uh -huh. that's why it's wrapped up so thoroughly you notice they're talking guns he's like oh mine's different it's lobayevs that's the company he says, we're not letting you go. He goes, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. Interesting. I wonder if it's semi-auto. You see this weird bolt configuration? <coughs> There's another one, again, pretty common. We've seen marksmen having their, their long-range rifle and then a, a smaller assault weapon, or like an assault rifle, you know what I mean? Um, like a battle rifle. So it's not a battle rifle. You know what I mean. But you know, this this dude, this dude looks, I mean, look at all this gear here. I think this is some sort of this is like a serious dude. It may be two dudes, honestly. But plate carrier. This is a good helmet by Russian forces standards. This is a very good helmet. Uh you don't see many guys with the backpacks. This is not this guy is a a uh, pretty well-trained soldier based on this gear. Um, he's probably one of the professional soldiers uh, within the Russian formation, not a conscript. решения. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things that's interesting here. When you run a TCP, guys, you're going to want to create what's called a serpentine. You see how he was able to build up speed as he pushed towards the traffic control point? You'd want to use, even you can use your own patrol vehicles to um, force the car to slow down and snake through. It gives you more of a chance and it gives the car less of a chance to 
gather speed and blow through your checkpoint. He's probably drunk. Режим военного положения. 30 минут как? Ты за девушкой идешь? Ну, я понимаю. Режим военного положения никто не отменял. Выходим с машины, предъявляем ряд, задний ряд сидений к осмотру. Свет выключен. Девушка, выходите с машины. Погоди. This is also really common. Uh, have the occupant search the car. If it's rigged to explode or has something that's going to harm the searcher, um, you want them to be the one to get caught. They won't. What they'll do is they just refuse. They'll be like, I don't want to open the trunk. And you'll know. <laughs> It's a toolbox. You can hear it. But you understand, right? You check it for weapons. But this is exactly how boring and useless it can sometimes feel to do uh, military police work. Um, again, imagine in, in doing this in Afghanistan where you're just like total waste of time. Um, right? And you're probably thinking, well, if you were carrying like a bunch of weapons, if you were a Ukrainian partisan or intelligence agent, you would just turn the car around when you saw the checkpoint, right? Yeah, I know. This is sort of the preposterousness of it. Again, these checkpoints are good for catching drunks, for catching very, very low sophistication criminals. But anybody that's there for serious business is just going to avoid this encounter. Or they're going to turn the car around, or they're going to pull it over. They're going to literally just toss out the gun or the explosives, and then they're just going to move through the checkpoint with their legitimate documents. Поднимите, говорит. Сейчас поднимай, поднимай. Бардай, сейчас как крыши. Что такое режим военного положения? 23.00 до 4.00. Будете задержаны, доставить доставлены в отдел полиции. Буквально. Yeah, he's like this is pain in the ass. Also, look at this dude, 511 beanie. Huh. Вот здесь. Добрый вечер. Все погасите, пожалуйста. Люди, ты из машины документы, багажник. Рекорд. Mm -hmm. Visual need, да? Да. Yeah. Uh -huh. давай to, uh, to the... Да. Да. So, yeah. All right, we've shown you what you're not going to see in the Western mainstream media. Whether you agree with what's uh, happening on either side of any contact line, it's always important to get as much information and educate yourself as much as possible on what's really... Yeah, I'll link to his channel in the description. And, you know, he, on the surface, he's not wrong. And, like, the truth is, if you want to report in Russia, even in an honest way, um, you're going to have to toe the line. And I, you know, I appreciate this. This is a perspective I would never have gotten otherwise. And I hope you guys got something out of it. So seriously, check it out. Support me on combatvetnews.com. Support this dude, Patrick uh, Lancaster. I think he's a little bit of a Russia stan, but I, I, you know, he, at least he's putting these videos out, which is more than I can say for a lot of other people. So thanks a lot, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.